Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to Aid Thompson and Other Disappointments, your twice weekly foray into the ferociously forlorn world of politics and dystopia. Um, if it's your first time listening, welcome, welcome. Uh, get yourself a beer, uh, take a seat. Consider this your local, your new favourite pub where you come and, uh, I don't know, um, just after you've heard some terrible news or, or whatever, we, we sit you down, we give you a nod and we say, yep, I know everything's really fucked, but I'll sit and drink with you. It's that kind of vibe. And, and we try to get a few doom lols jokes out along the way. Uh, I am your host, Aid Thompson, and tonight I'm super psyched to introduce you to my guest. Um, but first, a quick shout out to the Patreons for continuing their support for the show. Uh, what's up, guys? And uh, what's up, indeed, fellow Bimfluencers? Keeping it booge 24-7. Uh, looking forward to the first in-person live meetup that's exclusively for Patreon supporters. Uh, that's on Thursday, the 27th of October in London. If you want to come along, uh, drink beer and talk shit about Tories, realistically, with me. Um, more on the Patreon at the end of the show uh, in terms of what you get back for that ongoing support. Um, so my guest this week, uh, I happened across her uh, while me and my family were in Thailand. Uh, those of you who have listened to a few episodes of the show will know that we went over there for a month this summer. Um, you guys may or may not be aware uh, that our domestic press, our newspaper obsessed uh, and thus billionaire owned press as it is in this country, uh, what with the what the papers say segments on morning television and uh, two thirds of those newspapers being owned by right wing billionaires. Uh, shockingly, they do not have the same stranglehold on information overseas. Uh, and so when I was in Thailand, I was exposed to some really interesting journalism. Uh, there was no Sky News. There was no uh, self-satisfied red-cheeked bellend on a breakfast sofa quoting bylines from the sun and the telegraph it was uh, on tv a channel i had heard of but very rarely watched called al jazeera uh, and a news site called tiger uh, and anyway i was really impressed uh with with both um and my guest tonight has contributed to both of those outlets um and her output has uh i don't know it, it landed really well with me i thought it was really well put together journalism um and frankly, it opened my eyes in terms of my perspective of what Thailand is, what life is like there, some of the cultural struggles that they have. Uh, so I was really psyched uh, to get her secured for tonight's episode. So please welcome my guest tonight, Tara Apusakun. Have I, <laughs> have I pronounced that right? Please tell me yes. yes. No, it was very, very close. So it, it's fine. I'm Tara Apusakun. Hello. Good. Good. Um, so, um, if I if I didn't pronounce it right, just tell me that I did because I I just need that <laughs> confidence. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Welcome to the show, Tara. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, I've lately I've been a little bit under the weather, but um, I'm I'm hoping I'll uh, be good by uh, the end of tomorrow when I have to go back to work. Um, yeah, and luckily I still have my voice, so I'm still um, able to talk to you guys right now. So. Good, good. I mean, like, if you did lose your voice, we could probably just put this out as, like, an ASMR kind of, like, whisper <laughs> genre thing. Um, Sign language interpretive dance. Sure. <laughs> or something. Sure. I mean, <sighs> you got to go with what you got. It's a tough market in podcasting. Uh, let's just let's just work with what we've got here. Um People may not be so familiar with you over in, in the UK. As I mentioned earlier, like you've done some really great work in, in the outlets that I was exposed to in Thailand. Um, perhaps you could give us a bit of background, like how you got into journalism. Sure, sure. So this goes back to, um, okay, I graduated from college, or you would call it uni, um, in 2016. Okay. I was a history okay. major. And during my college years, I... Um, I was always, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. I just, I just knew that I liked certain classes or certain topics. So I majored in history. I ended up being interested the most in Middle East history. And that's where I, um, I took a lot of, uh, classes. So I guess uh, it does, it does lead into my personal background. So I'm a, I'm part Thai and I'm also part Iranian it kind of, it's kind of a random mix. I know. Okay. Um, during college, I was a bit more interested in the Middle East, actually. I did not have that much of an interest in Asia. 
Um, so like I was interested in human rights in, in the Middle East. And I mean, I, I hope people are seeing what's happening in Iran right now because this is like, this is such bullshit. I can't. Well, yeah. You know, in, um, in, in the intro, I was talking about how like billionaires basically have a stranglehold on the press in this country. And that, that sort of works to our benefit and t- to our great cost in media. So they at the moment, the big news story over here is the tanking pound and the recklessness of the of our domestic government. Um, but then even mm-hmm. the newspapers that are not owned by billionaire right wingers then respond to that story. And so you don't really get much like geopolitical stuff coming through at the moment. Um, perhaps mm-hmm. perhaps you could enlighten us like what's going on in Iran. Oh, yeah. yeah well, sure. um, Iran, it ha- has an Islamic Republic. I, I think people kind of probably know sure. that much though so it's um, a religious theocratic government they um they, basically they like to control what women wear they like to control a lot of things and they like to control what women wear um and, and if they have on enough hijab they recently killed a girl because she didn't have her hijab on enough and um for the past like week protests have erupted there, um, this is not the first time Iranians have protested their government. They've been protesting since the Islamic Republic came to power in, in 1979. Mm. Um, there's, this is obviously very simplistic, and there, there's a lot of kind of long history uh, there. And and you know, there's there's some Iranians who do agree with the government. Like that's how it's kind of able to be propped up. It's it's very complicated, but essentially. Um, Iranians are absolutely not having it with their government. They are literally, they're so brave that even though the um, police are shooting and and killing them, they are taking to the streets and they are climbing on billboards and and taking down the pictures of the Ayatollahs or the the Supreme Leader. Women are burning their hijab uh, in public. And so, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's like like For, revelatory kind of movements because that's the sort of stuff. Like, am I being completely outrageous here if I say that if you tore down an image of the Ayatollah, what's the jail sentence for that normally? I I don't even uh, know. And 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 by the way, like they they don't even apply their own technical laws correctly. Like that's what you see in a lot of countries, and, and you see this in Thailand too. By the way, like I've. Recently, I've really been putting together a lot of connections on what the, the, their dictatorships have in common. Anyway, that's another topic sure, for another sure. day. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so in countries like both Thailand and, and Iran, they have the, it's a problem that they have these really strict arbitrary laws. But another problem is they don't even um, apply their own laws correctly a lot of the time. Like, like they, you, you know... It, a jail sentence is supposed to be for however long, and but then they make it longer, or that they say you committed a certain crime, but even under their set of laws, it it doesn't qualify as being that crime. So it, yeah, I mean, no matter you know, no matter what the technical jail sentence is, I don't even know if that if they properly apply it or whatever. It's like, like how, how could you be a lawyer in a country like that? Like you'd be, what parameters would you be working with? It's like, well, this is the, this is the advised jail term for that. Well, is that what you're going to stick to? Well, I don't know. I'll see how I feel. Yeah. I, I don't know how human rights lawyers do it. I mean, human rights lawyers are under threat there and they're, they're like part of, they're one of the groups of people that are actually targeted mm. and put in jail, by the way. So, sure. yeah. Okay. So, so just sort of going back to your background. So, um, so you decided you were going to pursue journalism uh, around these sort of these geopolitical entities. Um, what was it that then sort of brought you closer to Thailand in that respect? So, yeah, so I, um, I don't have an Iranian uh, citizenship. I have a Thai citizenship. I, I have Thai and American citizenship. And, Basically, I um, I come from a particular area of the United States that that's the cost of living is really really high. If especially though, if you are a young person who has just graduated from college, okay, um, I was in my early twenties. Um, San Francisco is a very tough area uh, to live if you're a young broke person. Like, mm-hmm. like you just. Yeah, you can't really. I mean, I I could have 
had my own place, if I had had um, like two roommates or something, my friends are spread all over the country and all over the world. I didn't want to get random roommates. I um, basically, okay. The long story short is Thailand, being that it's still a developing country, it is much cheaper to live here. Um, Yeah, and and like job opportunities are, um, if you're kind of in a competitive field like writing and journalism, there are more opportunities here. And I just, I headed on over um, here because I have a citizenship and I wanted to kind of get back to my roots or get to explore it. I thought, why not? And I just, I just came here. Did you have any, <laughs> um, any hesitation in terms of, and look, I'm coming from a, a position of complete ignorance here. I don't know what it's like to be a journalist in Thailand, but uh, I have this sort of perception in the back of my head that you're not necessarily free to talk about whatever you like in Thailand, that there isn't the same traditional oh, oh, freedom no, of expression. No, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, so people have gotten in in trouble here in Thailand. What's, what's interesting though, is that in the 2020, um, protests in in Thailand, there was suddenly this big break where people got a lot bolder in what they say. Um, here, here's, here's how I'll put it. We're not allowed to, um, to insult or criticize certain institutions in Thailand, certain, um, higher powers it, it's actually you know I, I can say we're not allowed to insult our royal family sure um yeah i can i can say this um it's um it's a problem because arguably there is there are some things that should be criticized um now in 2020 things really really changed um in the way that people set it, p- protesters suddenly got a lot more bold about um, criticizing them. So it, there have been protests in Thailand in the past about our military coup and our government. Which, um, these things have a lot of connection to uh, the monarchy as an institution. But in 2020, people got a lot bolder in, getting, in explicitly talking about the monarchy. So not just talking about the governments and things that are like loosely connected right. to them, but... Uh, uh, people got very uh, explicit and, you, you know, a lot of young people have like been arrested for it and stuff. And just, just um, to be clear, I suppose if you looked at them side by side, the UK and Thailand, both constitutional monarchies, uh, we do criticise our royal family in the UK. Uh, but I feel like because they are effectively neutered, they have very little say in what goes on in the country politically, in theory. I mean, it's possible that behind closed doors, conversations take place. Um, But the sovereign um, is always looked at as she, sorry, I'm still talking in past tense, as like the queen and indeed now King Charles. Uh, They don't really have any say in what gets signed off. Basically, the prime minister comes to them with a bill that's ready to become law that's been voted on in the House of Commons. um, And they might not like what they're signing in, but, you know, they're allowed to continue to be king or queen um, only because they're neutered sort of thing. I hope I'm not butchering British history by saying that. That's my understanding of our setup. Um, It's slightly different in Thailand, isn't it? So the monarchy are still involved in making decisions or... I, Thailand is, Thailand is technically supposed to be the same. Right. Um, I, and by the way, I also want to say like, I don't want to make any big statements on this. Another sure. problem is we, we don't exactly know um, how involved certain institutions are. But I think so. We're supposed to be like you guys. Like they're oh, they're not really involved. They 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 just exist. But it's not exactly the same here. Right. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I won't push you any further on that. Let's let's talk a little bit about some of the areas that you've explored uh, in in your articles. So um, I um I wanted to sorry I I wanted to answer I I don't think I fully answered your question because you asked me like how aware was I going in. Mm, um, yes. Like when I first moved to, to Thailand, yeah, so I just I want to fully answer. That. I think actually I was more scared when I first moved. And, you know, my parents told me like Tara, just so you know, um, it, in for your journalism or, or whatever, you know, Dad is really worried because, 
Um, you, like you're not allowed to say anything about them. So at first I thought, oh, I really cannot uh, say stuff. Like, like I thought it was so serious. To be honest, and especially with the 2020 protests, but, but even for, it's not that serious. I, okay, I, I, that, that's a bad phrase to, to use. Like, it, you know, it can be very serious if they come for you. But a lot of people do say stuff out loud. Like, if I'm being very honest, I, I think maybe about, you know, 15 years ago or something, it was still quite serious. Like, people didn't really want to talk about it. In public. Nowadays, kind of everyone does mm. talk about it in the open. I'm I'm not being as open right now because I am being recorded. You know, this is going to be on sure, the internet. Sure. Yeah, yeah. If, but if you are just talking to a Thai person in an everyday conversation, quite frankly, people do talk about it. So I, I was actually more scared coming in. And, and then I realized, wait, everyone, like journalists and stuff, people do talk about this. So I, it's yeah. not super. So I'm just, yeah. Yeah, it's, it doesn't strike me as the sort of place where, you know, sometimes you see journalists, lit, like foreign journalists literally getting jailed. I mean, Iran is is a good example, right? They've jailed journalists. Um, I don't think like Saudi Arabia or anywhere have, have done anything that bad. Um, it, Thailand but, has jailed foreign journalists before. There, the, I think there are none in jail right now, but they have in the past. That should just be said. Right. Okay. You, um, would, you would know better than I. So, yeah. Um, let's... <laughs> Let's move on to to some of your sort of areas that you've you've looked into in your pieces. Uh, you've you've written eloquently about the sex trade in Thailand, um, and as a, as a Westerner, my perception of it has been that although it's a country famous for its beautiful beaches and and uh, backpacker culture, that there is a definite oh, yeah. seedy aspect, like a stag holiday layer to it. Uh, that yes, again, this absolutely. is just my perspective, right? It's something that the authorities have traditionally turned a blind eye to because it's sort of a deal with the devil almost. Like, like they're willing to tolerate fat old white guys paying for sex with tiny oh, Thai yeah. women if they bring all of their friends and they all rent a moped for a week. Like that's that's basically my my perception of the bargain <laughs> that they've made. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you you go on. You're about to say something. Yeah, well, I'm I'm just saying I don't. Th I think you're actually very very accurate. Like, yes, Thailand is known for its beautiful beaches and it's the land of smiles and whatnot. But as you you said, I think very spot on. Like, yes, there's a certain a, a seediness. Like that's literally what it is. Mm. Um. So I I don't think you just have like a an outsider understanding or what. I think your perception is accurate. To be it's honest. interesting, though, isn't it? Because it's it's in some ways a very conservative country. Like until recently, they've they had draconian laws and jail sentences for for even like marijuana use, right, or growing marijuana. Incredibly conservative uh, stance to take. Uh, if you speak ill of the royal family, incredibly conservative stances being taken there. And yet, with something like selling sex. It's arguably, I don't know if the official stance is that they love the sex industry, but they do seem to take a, a slightly more liberal stance on that one. See, OK, so this I think this leads to a, another topic where, OK, and it's something Thailand is infamous for is corruption. So I don't think it is n now it might have changed a few years ago. Thailand was literally uh, on this list of countries, literally ranked number one most corrupt country in the world. Really? Like, so, basically, okay. Short, shortly to be replaced by Great Britain. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. oh, yeah. you guys can't be that bad. No, I look. So basically, we we have a lot of these laws, and, and you're right that even the technical laws have been relaxing on things like marijuana and, and stuff. But anyway, we have all these technical laws, but there and it's so well known that that Thailand works this way that people literally make jokes about it. The joke, the running joke is basically as long as you know the right people, you can pay people off with bribes. So Thailand and just Thai authorities and police and stuff are infamous for the, this sort of bribe culture. Mm. Um, like, There's okay, a famous example, the isn't there? The, like, the, who's the Red Bull guy? 
I was reading about the he's the yeah. heir to the Red Bull fortune, or and he hit and ran someone like he he yeah, and then he he got off by like paying the family. I think like a lot of money or something. But, but yeah, so um, like, I, I was reading about it when I was out there, and it wasn't that much money. I mean, like, look, if somebody hits my son <laughs> with a car and robs me of fatherhood. Like and I have to stomach the fact that they're going to get off and just run away. They better be paying me. Like I don't want to put a price on my son's life, but it's probably it's probably more than like three hundred thousand dollars or whatever it was. You know, I don't even think it was yeah, that I, much. I think it was in tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, okay, yeah. I don't I don't actually remember the real amount, but yeah. So you gave a very good example. Like the the Red Bull case is of just one example of this bribery culture that exists among Thai authorities. And again, if you, you know, expats who live here, will it's literally just a running joke. Like, oh, he, he got in trouble because he didn't pay the right people, huh? you wow. know, like, it, and just everybody kind of knows this. So then relating that to, um, to what you said about the sex industry. Yeah. I mean, the police kind of know that it happens. And I, and I think, from my understanding or what I've heard b before, like they, they'll go to a place and they'll say like, okay, give us this much money not to arrest you kind of thing. And that's right. just, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. I've heard different. I mean, this is going back about 20 years. I went to Thailand doing that, uh, cliche UK backpacker thing. Uh, and oh. I went... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm one of those, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> I went to a full moon party and there were a uh, Wait, in Copenhagen? In Copenhagen, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the yeah, that, 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 that the party has a reputation. Yeah. Well, there was, I mean, there was drugs going around and there was the Samsung uh, buckets that supposedly have amphetamines in them or something. And I remember saying to people, I was like, do the police just not care? I thought it was like, you know, <laughs> jail sentences for people taking drugs and they were like if you get arrested or if they pull you to the side just offer them money and i was blown away i was like you try that in the uk and whatever trouble you're in you can double it because <laughs> i mean I, i've never tried bribing a policeman in the uk but my my sense is it would not go down well um but anyway sorry so let's let's get back onto the sex industry so perhaps like so from from my perspective i have this feeling of 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 what it's like over there of how it's set up and you've just sort of joined the dots on that in terms of how people uh, evade getting in in uh legal trouble what are some of the stereotypes around the thai sex industry and sex trade uh that might surprise people yeah i am um, see i was trying to think about uh, this because um well I mean, okay, firstly, one thing that um, it won't re really surprise people, but um, it's just really, really horrible and sad is that there are these horrible trafficking stories. Mm. Um, I understand that, you know, um, uh, quite a few um, sex workers really do want to do sex work, but uh, honestly, there are definitely a lot of people trafficked too. Mm. Um, I... Okay, so for example, I have spoken to a woman before. She's an activist. Um, her name is Sophia Loebel. Um, she, it's really, really dark. From uh, the age of four years old, um, she was four years old to twenty six. She was kept in a room to be the um, to do work trafficking and also sex trafficking. Right. It's horrific. Um, basically, she escaped by jumping out of a window and running away. But like she had been kept in, in just like a room her whole uh, life. It's completely uh, yeah. So this is the the kind of horrible thing that will really shock people. Um, mm. And is another that, does that happen a lot? Is that an isolated case or is? Um, well, now I, I, we're kind of jumping into the topic, which was going to be the sex trafficking. But um, mm. I can talk about the numbers. So okay. Um, in 2021, the U.S. Trafficking in Persons Report officially identified 
414 people who were human trafficked. So um, this includes for both uh, labor traffic and sex traffic. Right. Um, so 181 people were sex trafficked. Um, however, though, that, that's the number of people who were officially identified, like who they, they got records on. Yeah. The estimates for how many people are human trafficked overall um, from the Global Slavery Index it, in 2018, it estimates that 610,000 people in Thailand are human trafficked, either Jesus. labor or sex. Yeah. Colossal. Yeah. And what, what a huge gap in between official and uh, uh, like well-versed experts estimating yes so um i think it makes I, I, this is another thing i was going to talk about i think it makes sense that there is a really really big gap between the estimate and how many they've managed to officially find because the um the work of ngos and the government in trying uh, to um find victims and trying to hunt down the perpetrators is very dangerous mm. so like i've um the, this isn't someone I talk to, but I've I've talked to someone who talked uh, to um, to um, a worker who tried to rescue people from the trafficking industry. He said this person had um, like m mafias, like trafficking mafias, kind of coming after him and mm -hmm. stuff. And he would he would have to move to new locations or he couldn't go back to certain bars because he knew that the pimps were, were on to him. Like they, they knew that he was secretly trying to help girls get out. This is sort of what I was about to tap into there. Like where you said it's, it's basically a, a standing joke, how corrupt the country is. I suppose that then taps into the trafficking issue, because if you are looking to liberate free uh, women from a trafficking operation where like in the same place where police are routinely bribed to just look the other way and let this business continue you have to assume that that relationship probably exists further up the chain also so when you then come in to try to dismantle or destroy the apparatus of this operation do people further up the chain then sort of come down and ar arrest you for something you know trumped up charges mm -hmm. that sort of stuff or Okay, so for this part, I I want to be a little bit careful because it, to be honest, I don't I think I don't know enough about how Thai police usually act into sex trafficking. Um I just want to note so okay, the the way that countries are ranked on how good they're doing at fighting trafficking is tier 1, tier 2, tier 3. Mm. Tier 1 means uh, it is like the Western uh, world, it, you know, like it means they're doing the best job that they can mm -hmm. at fighting trafficking. Tier three means they're doing a really bad job at, at fighting trafficking. I, I Here's the thing. Thailand is a tier two country. So clearly it's, you know, it's not doing as well as the developed world. But I do just want to note, though, um, it's not a tier three country. OK, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think that so Thailand... they're doing something. They're taking steps to try to address yeah. it, but it's perhaps not moving forward in in the ways that we would like. Yes, and so with what you said about um, bribes, I, I think so. I think Thai police are bribed a lot in, in terms of a lot of a lot of nightlife, um, a, a lot of um, the the sex work world. I think that if they know that um, uh, there's a place where people are being tra uh, trafficked. I, I think that quite a few police actually will do something about it. Mm. I, I kind of feel, though, that, that the problem is that the, the trafficked people are too scared to, to go to the police, though. So mm. as, as long as the police don't officially know or nobody is tipping them off, then they don't really have a reason to try to look into it. Right. I. And, and so basically, I, I think the trafficked people don't really have a way to report it because they, you know, they are watched every second by like their pimp or their trafficker or, or whatever. So they they can't report it is a, a big problem. Do you think there could be some and I'm not saying there is or there is not. I'm just asking like I'm just asking questions. Uh, 
is is it possible that there is a reluctance to really solve this problem because the seedy part of thai uh tourism industries is is there like if they did solve people trafficking then fewer people would fly over there like to spend their winters in in the hot climate paying thai women to do god knows I, what i mean i think that is probably a part of it yes mm. um yeah and it, it's probably the same um about drugs for example i mean we we actually do have all these drug crackdowns. I mean, you read um, like one article that um, it it's about, originally from the Who Get It. Yeah, it's about we meth. Have, I was like, whoa, yeah. they've got meth there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we actually do have a lot of these like drug crackdowns and stuff. But yeah. the thing is, the the industry just continues overall. Like even though we we have crackdowns, it's there. It, it's like you know. You, you're not nobody's really cutting off the head of the snake. I'll say that. Right. Um, and so in, in terms of the reason for this, like, why doesn't it completely officially end or, or I mean, not completely, but why doesn't it stop being this huge problem? Yeah, I maybe it's because they know that, you know, a lot of people are making an income from this. Mm. Um, I don't know exactly all of the reasons, but yeah, there's just there's so many problems here that you hear about all these crackdowns, but the problem never actually goes away. I think there's, um, yeah, there's probably uh, like not economy in the official sense. There's probably like economic concerns though, which you've just alluded to. Um, and, and another example of that is, uh, it's sort of going back to the sort of uh, Thai conservatism piece also. Like when I was over there, I was kind of struck by when I go into a 7-Eleven, which for any any Brits that have not been in over to Thailand or, or indeed to the US, a 7-Eleven is a sort of like local co-op, like corner store. And you go into the 7-Eleven and all the cigarettes are blanked out. So you can't see what cigarettes you're buying. And presumably that is a health initiative that they've put in to stop people or to, to, uh, to, uh, to stop companies from promoting harmful tobacco pro products, right? So that makes sense. And yet people aren't, asked to wear motorcycle helmets or nobody seems to wear motorcycle helmets or they'll put three people on one fucking moped like i saw pe i saw mothers riding around on mopeds with like a, a almost newborn baby i'm like that is yes. not safe and nobody cares about yeah. the safety element of that but here's where it kind of links back to that economic thing i was explaining this to my girlfriend i was like it's because they're in too deep at this point if they suddenly announced a new initiative next week that it was illegal to ride your moped without a helmet and you couldn't put your baby on there with you you have to buy a car it would like how many hundreds of thousands of people or millions of thai people would be plunged into economic uncertainty because they don't have a car or they'd have to pay for the extra lessons or they can't afford a thai helmet like they're in too deep at this stage so my helmet expensive so there's actually there's several articles about this um Another issue, so there have been so many times where I've asked the person, like, oh, do you, ha you have another a helmet? And they say, no, they don't have another one. So when I ride on the moped, I have to go without a helmet. Like, this is something that happens a lot. Like, I need to get to my place. I'm in a hurry. And if it's only a short distance, then I'm like, you know, I, I guess... I guess I won't have one. I know that it's technically still my fault because I, I should just, you know, choose to be late instead or whatever and not risk my life. But frankly, like I, I'm in a hurry. And so, yeah, no, this is another kind of big running joke, by by the way, like, oh, uh, you know, um, a motorcycle got an accident. It was, was he not wearing a helmet? Like everybody yeah. kind of just knows. But yeah, so you're so right. To go, Thailand, back, to go back to the yeah. meth thing or to, to the broader drugs issue. Um, I guess it's kind of similar to that then. And, and by all means, correct me if I'm wrong, that if they did suddenly crack down on whoever is making the real money and the big decisions within the drug industry and cartels and, and all of that, um, it would affect a, a whole uh, food chain of other people involved, suppliers, logistics firms, uh, farmers. So, so yes, it, it would um, affect a food chain. and But also... Um, 
Uh, okay, maybe this is another factor that I can bring up is um, the status of the people who are on top of it. So um, you were just talking about drugs, but now I'll bring it back to trafficking. So mm-hmm. sometimes when when you hear about these big crimes in Thailand, um, the the person who's in charge of it is someone who is of a very high status. Uh, I'll give a, a specific example. There was a case a few months ago where some very wealthy family in Thailand, a father and a daughter, um, they were not named, but they apparently own uh, like a, a sausage company or something like that. So this very wealthy father and daughter were um, involved in a trafficking scandal where they they like lured um, Thai women into going to working in massage parlors in Dubai. And uh, um, yeah, I think I think Dubai, and and this has happened a few times. Is some Thai women have gotten lured into going to work in the Middle East, mm-hmm. thinking they're going to work as a masseuse, but it's trafficking. So, uh, um, in this one case that I'm talking about as an example, um, the, these people were a very a high status rich family. So this is the other element that I'm going to bring in, into it. Is it's not just that that it's a whole chain and it's lots of people. But also sometimes the people who are in charge are are high status people. And and in Thailand, we have um, this whole cultural thing of people who are are rich or of a high status or come from a prominent family or, or whatever are at the top. You Yes, you could argue it's like this in the West, too. Of course, it's not only Thailand. And look, I, I get that. But Thailand really... Um, anyone who lives in Thailand will maybe understand more what I'm talking about. We really have this culture of, um, hierarchy, Mm. a hierarchical culture, um, like in a certain particular way. And so that's the other element of this is that sometimes the people who are in charge of these trafficking, uh, scandals are high status people. I, um, Another th- thing, there was another case earlier this year. I, I want to get the details right. Um, another trafficking case where the people in charge were youth workers or something, or they work for for some sort of like youth council or or whatever. So it's like this is someone who is a uh, in charge of policy surrounding uh, like young people, and they were involved in a trafficking scandal. So it, it's really like. Mm. The people who are supposed to protect or people who are supposed to do um, certain uh, jobs in Thailand are doing the opposite of it. So, so yes, um, to go off of what you're uh, saying, the, the status thing connects to the, the food chain that you were talking about. Um, because, yeah, so our authorities know that if they were to really crack down on these things, whether it's drugs, whether it's trafficking, whether it's whatever, they just let everyone in the um in the network is like infected or at least like one person in the network is infected and it just they're in too deep like you said i suppose where you've got such a a a sort of formalized class structure and a, a culture or a tradition of people who are well connected getting away with things then when yes. you've got these high status individuals involved in in whatever scheme it is i guess then that would make the authorities go well look do i really want to go barking up that tree because if it doesn't if it all falls to pieces if my case isn't 100 percent solid i could be in all kinds of trouble because look how connected they are right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah so um i hadn't really thought about that element before but yeah i i think the point you bring up is kind of kind of logical like it, it would definitely be that way where if you're worried that maybe you don't have the, all of the details of a case exactly right, like mm-hmm. you know, maybe they didn't traffic this many people. It was actually this many people. Or if you are worried you don't have your facts straight 100%, mm-hmm. then that that really powerful person can go after you over that one little detail that you're wrong about. So I think that you're logistically you're right that there's there's probably a fear of that too. Like, well, if I'm not 100% right. And then I can't bring this out of the case. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that you mentioned there was that, uh, so you have these youth workers who are sort of presenting themselves as as uh, the solution to a lot of these problems. And actually, it turns out that they are not just part of the problem, but um, uh, almost directing it. Um, yes. 
I am I for that particular thing. Okay, th- this was kind of a long time ago. I don't remember the exact like the exact group or um, agency that they were part of, but it it was something related to mm. youth, and then they were involved in trafficking. And I suppose they what they're relying on there is that people in you know regular people you would like to think decent people would never ever suspect that somebody wearing that uniform answering that phone for that organization would ever be involved in something as sordid and cruel as doing the thing that they say like how could somebody be that dishonest and sociopathic and so on and uh, there's a there's a sort of parallel there with um I mean it's not quite the same thing but uh so a, a few weeks ago my girlfriend got a call uh from the bank in quote um, okay. inverted speech marks and uh they said oh your account has been compromised um there's some weird activity can i just check with you that this is you so she said okay what's going on and they said uh, have you used your card in edinburgh in scotland and uh, she said no she goes okay have you used it in manchester in the last 24 hours she said no and they said oh well your account's been compromised then here's what we need to do we need to set up a brand new account and you need to log in on online banking so we know that it's secure and it's you. And then I need you to transfer all of your money from this account to this new account. And she was like, uh uh-huh. yeah. And it she she's relaying this to me. Like I'm just sat on the sofa working, but my ears are pricking up. I'm like, this doesn't sound right. Like and uh and she said that the guy that she was talking to, super, super polite, very well spoken. He said that he was from the serious fraud office within the bank um, and that they only had a limited amount of time to do this transaction uh, or the insurance would run out on her on her account. Uh, and then if she hadn't transferred it by that point, it would be open season for whoever had compromised the account and she would never get any of the money back. And she had a few thousand in this account for her, her business yeah. account. And... Uh, uh, so I got up, I walked over and I said, like, put it on, put it on mute, put it on silent. So she puts it on silent. And I said, like, ask him what department he works in and ask him if you can call him back. And just see what he said. And uh, she asked, she unmutes and she says, yeah, can I just check what team you're in? And can I please call you back on the main number? And then he says, no, um, I mean, you can do, but there's an hour's wait and any money that goes missing from your compromised account in that time, you have no insurance, you won't be covered for. So I then, wait, I was like, cut, 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 like hang up. Uh, and then obviously, you know, she does phone back the bank and then she says, I think I was just talking to one of your guys. Um, and then the bank said those horrible words, like make your stomach go cold. They were like, nobody from the bank has called you today. And she's like, oh, thank God I didn't transfer that money. <laughs> And I'm like, but yeah. this is like to bring it back to the example that you were talking about a minute ago, what they prey on is this um, this expectation that you would never think that somebody would pretend to be the savior of your like fraud or people trafficking or, you know, whatever the social issue is that some. Oh, well, I'm one of the good guys. I'm trying to stop you being defrauded here. So listen to me, do what I say and you'll be OK. Wink, wink. And it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? It's like, I, I'm here to solve people trafficking. Just come with me. Just come, in, come into this hotel room. Give this man a massage. I, I promise it'll be all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, yeah, I, I think, um, and, and no matter what country we're talking about, yeah, I think that that's like one thing that these narcissistic criminals do. It's like, oh, he would never lie about, being on that agent if he's on that agency or that committee he would never do that actual uh, that but that specific crime mm. because he there's no way he could get away with it because they're always checking for it mm. but, but there, there is like, like there was uh, there was a case here in thailand where like someone on the anti-corruption body got in trouble for corruption like that's literally <laughs> it goes we, in our country so so yeah it, it's, it's like the same here though this, Tara. This, this, he could never is kind of a part of it yeah. yeah it's it's the same here though in the upper echelons of the conservative party who have been in power for 12 years so the uh until very very recently uh i think it's the anti-corruption czar so in number 10 downing street the guy who is charged with looking out for corruption within the government is the husband 
of the wife who was accused of siphoning 37 billion out of the public oh. coffers into a phony test and trace system. Nobody knows where that money went. W was it laundered? Was it handed off to cronies? Was it given to people like donors who donated to the, the, the Conservative Party? Um, they, we still never really got answers to any of those questions. Uh, and people go, oh, well, it's corruption. You should report it to the anti-corruption. And, and it becomes like a similar thing, like a standing joke. Oh, fucking hell, yeah. Should we report it to this guy over here? He's, he's probably made a dividend out of it. But just to go back to, yeah. to what you were saying a second ago, yeah, I mean, I think there is this expectation on the public's part that somebody who is at a senior position like that, whose entire role is supposed to be making sure that X doesn't happen, would never do that. And actually, I think, once you peel away the layers, um, what you realise is similar with the Financial Conduct Authority, I think it is over here, or the press regulator. What you find is the people who go into these positions of these sort of checks and balances entities are ex industry. So they come from banks or they come from the press. And there's, there could be a really good reason why that individual has been put into that checks and balance role. And it's not because they're a really good policeman and they're, good, they're there to make sure that everything runs smoothly. They're being put into that position because they're a chum of the people who are doing the dirty and then they know they can get away with it better. Oh, yeah. Um, what you said about like certain people being a chums or, or whatever in, in the UK. So Thailand also has a very, very big um, connections culture. Like I mentioned the hierarchical culture. I think one thing that goes along with that is the culture of having the right connections. And it's connected to have it, like having the right connections to the hierarchy, if that makes sense. Mm. So, um, yeah, sorry, what, what was I going to say? I, I was going to keep going with that. Um, yeah, so it, with it's like, yeah, with connections. Did you pay them enough, did you pay them enough money? Mm. Um, and if not, do you have the right connection? Okay, I remember what I was going to say. Sure. So you brought up the Red Bull case, right? Mm -hmm. So that that is an example where his connections are his family. Like he comes from, he's the Red Bull heir, basically. Um, and, and so he has this family with lots of money. And so he um, he gets let off. Um, and, and so I think that thing that you, you talked about with the chums over here, maybe um, it, the specific th thing is that we have like, what family are you from or right. what circle are you from is kind of what gets people away with a lot of things. In some ways, I kind of this is going to you need to take this in the spirit with which it is intended. Uh, in some ways, I quite like it. I quite like that. It's just so outwardly like brash. <laughs> It's just like brazen. It's like, yeah, there's a class structure here. And if you've got money, you're going to be all right like that. Whereas in the UK, it's like we kid ourselves that actually we've gone past the class thing, that there's equality, that it's some sort of egalitarian meritocratic utopia that we live in now. Oh, well, I was born on a council estate and I just went to a poor school, but I can be anything I want. Like, like once you yeah. uh, expose yourself to how unfair uh, society in Britain can still be and this this sort of cold iron fist of classism that continues to wreak havoc across British society like you only have to look at like the current cabinet in the UK uh, and see how many of them were privately educated how many of them went to Oxford or Cambridge and shook hands with each other and then later on further down the line they gave each other jobs um, but I how many how many state school educated people were overlooked because this person knew that person from their university days. So I, I kind of, I almost like the fact that it's the, well, okay, yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess that's how it, it is, you know? Knows it. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, no, no, I don't think that's a ridiculous statement. And I'll, I actually, I kind of get what you mean. I mean, in a way, it does disturb me that people are so open about it. But yeah, like I get what you mean. Like in Thailand, it's kind of just known, like, mm. uh, you know, the people who have power are in charge. And we all uh, know it. So there, I'll admit there's something refreshing about that. Um, with what you just said about the UK, I know that you're technically the interviewer right now, but I would actually like to ask you, you kind of some questions about oh, the whole sure. UK. Yeah, far system. away. Because I, uh, so for 
for my work and my writing, I'm connected with a lot of people around the globe, like, like a lot of people who I've never met in person, but just their, their writing contacts. There's this one contact I have who, who's British. She lives in the UK and she's uh, talked about this before. And she's, she said before, um, I cannot stand the class culture in the UK and how it's still a very real thing o over there. And so it, I am. Um, I at first was a bit surprised to hear this because, as an American, you know, you guys are are much more ahead of us in things like free healthcare. Um, I, I know you still, guys still have problems, but but like you're, you you guys are much more European and much more egalitarian than than we are because, because in America it's really really bad. So I was kind of I was a little bit surprised. It's like oh they still really have the class system. What and what what she said is that. In the, the UK, it's not just about money, but class is very like, which family did you come from? And like, does does your family have a whole like history with the aristocrats and then your accent? Like there's this whole accent oh, prejudice yeah. thing. Mm. So this is like, this is all a very, still a prominent thing. Uh, yes and and no. So you've, you, you've rightly kind of tapped into the fact that uh, that that there are some aspects of british society that are uh, perhaps more progressive for want of a better word uh, free healthcare being one of them um then there's other aspects of british society that are still very troubling uh, accent is is a big one and it it's sort of um not rubs me up the wrong way but it's it's definitely a sort of pinch point for me because my dad worked for the bbc uh, so he was able to sort of string a sentence together, if you like. He's quite a good communicator. Um, uh, uh, my mum read a shit ton. Like, she's just always stuck in a book. And she had elocution lessons in her teenage years. Um, so me and my brother, although our parents split up, we grew up on council estates, which is a slightly more de deprived upbringing. We didn't go to private school. We went to state school. But because of the way our parents spoke, we came off as being reasonably like educated or, you know, articulate, um, which sounds like a blessing. But then it's also like if you're the one kid <laughs> on your council estate who speaks like that, that's actually quite you, you're attracting the wrong attention at times. Uh, oh, you're a posh kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, I, I can't think of any specific times I was bullied for it, but it's like I was definitely conscious of it. Um, mm hmm then you get to senior school and uh whether you choose to acknowledge it or not there's something called un subconscious bias unconscious bias where you warm to people who are very similar to you and so i would make friends with people who i thought looked and sounded like i did who were invariably white middle class well-spoken uh types but whose parents were directors <laughs> and like public relations consultants and stuff. And so I would then go to their houses with big gravel driveways, five bed, six bed houses detached. Um, but I would then be, you know, the kid who came from the single parent thing and the council estate. Like, so it's, it, it creates all sorts of, or it, it did create a lot of pinch points uh, for me. Um, and now I'm a bit obviously further down the line. I'm acutely aware of where my accent and quote unquote class comes into things. I think I have secured employment with jobs and interviews and conversations with people and listeners probably for the podcast based almost entirely on the fact that I can speak in a certain way and I pronounce things in a, in a certain way and that I come off as somebody that they think because of how they've been raised and conditioned by society. They think that the way this person speaks Oh, that's somebody I should speak to now. If uh, or speak, uh, listen to. Sorry, um, ironically, I'm fumbling my words now after talking about communicating well. Um, <laughs> so it's like there's a definite thing to it in in British culture. People will listen to you and take you more seriously for certain roles and responsibilities if you speak a certain way or if you sound like you went to private school. Um, I think if yeah. I sounded like the way that a lot of people on council estates did in my hometown, if I just Enter the podcast like this, like yeah, and then we just started talking like like this, little bit Jack the Lad, little bit like old school Cockney. Like, yeah, yeah. People would yeah, be like, yeah. "Who the fuck is this idiot? Like, why am I listening?" Like, that's honestly people's attitude to it. And yet, yeah, if you sound like this or like somebody who was quote unquote educated, 
I've had, I used to DJ. I used to like play music in a bowling alley, which is like the lowest <laughs> run of like entertainment and speaking. And, and yet because of the way I spoke, I had a customer come up to me and say like, he was surprised that somebody as educated as me was doing DJing in a bowling alley out of nowhere. I wasn't even talking to him about anything. Like he just came up and felt the need to tell me that I sounded too educated to be, you know, like he should give me an opportunity. He should give me an interview for a job at his big hedge fund or something. Like it was fucking bizarre. I was like, thanks it, a person I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Y yeah. So I, I think, I'm sorry, I've taken us way off of our sure, original sorry, I went topic, which is there. You... like um, <laughs> about Thailand. But like, yeah, I basically, I just think it's interesting because yeah, in, in America, and, and my British friend kind of noticed this too, but in America, what matters is you yourself are successful. We don't really, I mean, we care a little bit about your accent if it's like a really strong Southern accent, but if it's not really strong, people don't really care about your accent. And they don't really care about if your family had money. It's just, are you yourself rich? Did you yourself become a doctor and, and make lots of money? So that, yeah, I, I find it interesting that you guys still have a bit more of like a complex view of what exactly class is and how it's a lot more than just money for you guys. They just, yeah, kind I think of interesting too. Yeah, if you're in one of the sort of major aristocratic families, like if you were related to Princess Di if you were a Spencer or a Middleton, uh, or, oh. or a, a Parker Bowles or, you know, like your family grew up in a big stately home or something. Uh, I think people would take notice and take you very, very seriously at, at whatever country club or business meet you were at. Um, in everyday yeah. life, I don't know if, I, I think it's more to do with how you speak and probably a little bit to do with where you went to school. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. The weirdest, weirdest class thing I ever had is it a class thing or an age thing maybe more of an age thing uh i used to work at a big four consultancy in canary wharf and one of the directors there was i was working in recruitment uh like hr and uh we had to do this graduate recruitment program to to drastically up the numbers of graduates that we were bringing in that year and uh and I said, is there anything like different universities or different places that you want to bring people in from specifically? And I meant like, you know, what's your favorite universities? Which universities run decent uh, degrees that you would then bring people in from? And he took this as well, like, what, what demographic would you like to hire? And uh, he said, like, so he, he said like Reading University and ob obviously Oxford and Cambridge and, you know, Leeds and, and a few other ones. Uh, and then he said, oh, and by the way, like, no, no over 30 graduates. And I was like, huh? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I said, why? Why, just out of curiosity, why not over 30? And he said, uh, I just think it says something about somebody, like, if they can't get their shit together by the th time they're 30. Like, I was like, wow. <laughs> and it's, like, it's not quite classism, but it is snobby, right? It just kind of like general elitism perhaps or like general judgmentalism yeah perhaps it's just a sort of i mean i'm always fascinated by that sort of attitude where it's like half half probably that they think that's true but then half, at least as much is to do with like ego stroking like when i was 25 I had two businesses on the go and I bought my first house. Like it's a way of getting you to acknowledge and focus on them and their achievements rather than it being really about any candidates. Or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, anyway. Sorry, Tara, we've, we've run out of time. We've been chatting. I've been chatting for a long time. Uh, uh, so sorry to, uh, to steal the mic so much from you, but this has been a really interesting chat. Thank you. Um, and I encourage any of you to, to give Tara a follow. You're on Twitter, right? Um, I am. Yeah. Um, I'm so at Tara Apasakun. So, so, okay. My first name, Tara, T-A-R-A, -A, my last name, A-B-H-A-S-A-K-U-N. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And that's on Twitter. Um, and then are you writing now for sort of just freelance or for a place that people can catch up with you frequently or a blog or anything? Oh, sure. Um, I regularly write daily news for the tiger um, and and uh, where I collect um, information from other articles and I, I condense it. Um, 
and then I, I write kind of longer and more um, uh, in-depth features articles for um, a, a number of places. So I have articles on coconuts and um, in the past I wrote for Southeast Asia Globe. So you can find my work um, on those websites. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I, I noticed earlier, so I was like Googling your name. Uh, so I, I, people will have no problem finding uh, some of your work. So uh, once again, thank you so much to my guest tonight, Tara Apasakun. Um, again, I'm hope, hoping that I'm nailing that. Yeah, that was actually... Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much, Adrian. It was so nice to be on your show. Sure. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, I hope our, hope our bridges cross in the future. Um, quick shout out again to the Patreons. Um, thank you uh, for continuing your support of uh, the podcast. Um, every person that starts uh, supporting on Patreon, um, it just helps the podcast to grow. It means that I can start banking some money and investing in new tech and cameras and stuff and traveling to events. Um, so it is honestly um, super, super appreciated. Um, shout outs to each of you now. So that's uh, Alex, Chris, Rax, Ricardo, Silent, T-Rex, Oliver, Sarah, Paul and Kerry. Uh, you guys make life worthwhile. And uh, if you are considering uh, supporting the podcast, there are three tiers on Patreon. Uh, the first one is three pounds a month. So just enough for me to buy a coffee, really. And a, a quick doff of the cap from you saying thanks for the podcast aid. Really enjoying it. Um, then there's a second tier, which is five pounds a month, which gets you exclusive early access to every episode. Uh, but it also gets you an invite to the meetups. And the first of those is taking place on Thursday, the 27th of October in London. So it's not too late to get involved in that. If you would like to come and meet me and some friends from the world of political uh, social media commentary, um, it will be in East London on the 27th of October, jump on the Patreon. There is a third tier, which is absolutely fucking ridiculous. It is £10 a month. Nobody needs to jump on that. But if you did decide to, if you were a huge super fan, uh, you get all of the aforementioned benefits, the invites, the early access, like first look to the podcast. Um, and you also get a monthly £10 a month Skype call with me and the other, you know, £10 a month people. Um... So, yeah, so there's that. So there's a three pound or a five pound or a ten pound tier. Should you wish to uh, to to support the podcast? I will be back uh, on Wednesday night with the usual solo edition, which uh, if it's your first time listening, it's just me talking shit, really, about the news and roasting shit a little bit. Um, and then I'll be back on Friday night with another guest, which I'm super, super psyched about. Um, thanks again, everyone, for listening. I'll be back soon. Take care of yourselves. Ciao for now. <laughs>